Hello, my friends. I am Rick, and this is your seat at the table. It is a kind of gloomy Saturday here in central Iowa, and we are looking at the Jade Falcon Sourcebook for Battletech, the FASA Corporation. This thing came out in 1992, and of course, it came out. It was you know, pre preceded by Clan Wolf Sourcebook and a, a whole slew of others. The Jade Falcons have always been an interesting uh, clan to me. I mean, I'm a fan of the wolves, of course, uh, that bit of, tend to be a bit biased that way t up until a certain point until the wolves start going uh, south and goobery. What are you doing, Frankie? And of course, Frankie the shoulder cat over here messing with my door. Okay, Frankie, you coming in or staying out? Can't have it both ways. You want to have that door all the way open. Oh, I could do edit after edit after edit, and I would still have issues with the cats. It is what it is. Anyway, so when the clans arrived, the, the Falcons, you know, it depends on what kind of camp you're in. There's a lot of fans of the Ghost Bears, and Ghost Bears have got some good points. And, and of course, the, the more, quote, reviled or hated would be the Smoke Jaguars, because uh, they're the most aggressive and most urban, you know, most conservative of the clans when it comes to the crusader mindset and uh, perhaps the most quick-tempered as well. And uh, it's a love-hate relationship depending on how you look at it. Clan Wolf, of course, is the epitaph of all the, the clans themselves and uh, depending on how you look at them as well. The Jade Falcons are interesting because they're both aggressive and ability, they have the ability to learn and adapt, even if it's a little slower. Uh, they have uh, some intelligent individuals running the show. They are clearly in the Crusader camp, but they are also uh, traditionalists in many ways, but are also uh, adaptive, I guess is what I'm looking at. Uh, there's been a number of novels. Of course, uh, we don't see very many in the, in the hierarchy of the lore, there has not been a whole lot of novels until recently dealing with like the Ghost Bears, for example, or Smoke Jaguars, or any of the other clans as many or as depth in depth as the uh, Jade Falcons and Clan Wolf. I'm just pointing out the obvious if you're not familiar with the novels, especially the uh, older edition stuff. So let's see, introduction. History of Clan Jade Falcon. Talk about Elizabeth Hazen, Legend of Turkana, exclusive Jade Falcon blood names, Daniel Matloff, various key founders of the clan, the culling. So it's with great pleasure that I announced with, with which. Each clan shall become home to my heart and the hearts of those Kerenskis who will follow. The clan I have chosen possesses a collective intelligence I admire, the burning passion of true hunters that I desire, and above else, all else is blessed with a spirit of which will serve as a beacon uh, to all the rest. I choose to mingle my blood legacy with Clan Wolf, Ilkhan Neg uh, Nicholas Kerensky. And, of course, Clan Jade Falcon's hopes for ultimate glory died when Nicholas chose his destiny to Clan Wolf. P publicly, the can uh, the clan reacted to the announcement by swearing anew their undying loyalty to the ill clan and his new command privately reeled with shock and outrage. How dare he not pick the Falcons? Uh, the Golden Century called a crusade. Reister Ellis Critchell, the compromise. Go, go boat. The compromise. You do not trust the wolves, for they have proved themselves creatures of opportunity, of individualism, and lacks morals and unforgivable disregard for our origin. Yet I respect them, for they are warriors bred true in accordance with our tradition. But to send the wolves' freeborn bastards to the inner sphere is holly heaped upon folly, fellow cans. I swear upon my oath to Turkana herself that once these lowborns are free of the clan obedience, they will never willingly return. Can, uh, Khan Yavin has in a speech to the Grand Consul during the Wolves' Dragoons debates. And as much as you gotta love or hate the whole situation, her prediction was not wrong. At, at the end of the day, Wolf's Dragons remained in the inner sphere. Although, to their defense, they were tasked that way by the Wolf Khan at that time. Just pointing that out. The Go Vote, Operation Revival, Proof Reaction, 
the barony of Strang. I, the Baron of Strang, care not for your new names. Clans, Jade Falcons, call you. I call you by your true names. Scum of the Star League, traitors of free will, persecutors of the periphery, come back to lord it over freedom-loving people. Come ahead, you steel-eyed robots. Come ahead and taste what a million like-minded people think of you and your damn clans. Baron Stefan von Strang in replying to the Jane Falcon challenge. You know, I'm not a big fan of some of these bandit kings and, and would-be pirate lords and stuff like this, but I have to admit that, mis uh, that the Baron Baron von, uh, von Strang here put it to put it to the table and had the clans listen to this guy they didn't understand that they were biting off something bigger than they could have hoped to ever co uh, cope with and the clans have never been the same the invasion of the inner sphere battle to Kiad, the wars of reaving the current ongoing clashes to see the decimation of clan after clan after clan after clan even in the ill clan era just pointing out that this was not a good good move for the clans and they've suffered and paid in ways that they are not capable of, of recognizing first wave falcon and flight trail one second wave falcon strikes apollo so first wave conclusions success fellow warriors and with it under undream riches and wonders we are truly blessed to live to see this day a comment from anonymous falcon warrior for clan fajak on the first wave of the invasion produced unhoped for rewards each world they conquered yielded a unique bounty of natural resources far surpassed by the most avarice dreams of falcon merchants while the falcon warriors appreciated the economic potential of conquest represented the most fell victim to the condition their scientists called uh, named Conqueror's Euphoria. For the most, Euphoria manifested an almost childlike gawking and reverence for what, they'd, um, what they had been destroying just hours before in pursuit of victory. The Euphoria made others far from uh, reverential, and they took gross liberties with the conquered people and property. See, something to take into account, and I've said this before, the clans had a bunch of misguided conceptions and poorly thought out ideals on how this invasion of the inner sphere was going to roll out and the fact that they came in from the rear they basically stabbed the inner sphere great houses in the back they attacked from from the back and they did so in a, which by traditional terran human concepts and ideals an attack from the back out of cold, to pull a complete surprise is a very dishonorable thing to do. The clans didn't understand or didn't see it or didn't care, it doesn't matter. But the truth of the matter was, as we well know, the, the inner sphere houses, for the most part, were always concentrated uh, uh, closer to the core, closer to their internal borders, because the conflict and real true dangers to their entities came from their rivaling house lords, which they had to worry about each house manipulating, maneuvering, and attacking, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the bulk of their their elite units, their, their logistics chain was designed to move outward, inward, and not the other way around. So by coming in from the periphery in such a manner, and hitting it without well, with literally no warning, the clans had a cakewalk in that first year. And things got gradually more difficult the closer they got to the core and the more that the inner sphere houses were able to mobilize forces and numbers, pure numbers and material, and pour back up the logistics plane, otherwise moving outward or inward out towards the periphery and to the borders, uh, things started to change for the clans. And uh, I, I truly believe that I do not think that the clans could have totally conquered any of the houses. By definition, even if they had taken Luthien, if they had ta if if uh, the outreach uh, uh, meetings hadn't taken place and the inner sphere hadn't cooperated to the degree that they did, I still think the sheer numbers, the sheer size of the inner sphere, was too big to swallow, and the sheer numbers that they were facing would have went out. Eventually, they would be overtaken by wave after wave after wave. Not to, that it wouldn't have been a very devastating conflict to the inner sphere by inner sphere standards. Uh, it, things would have been much, much worse if the Battle of Tukiad hadn't taken place and the Comstar uh, put, you know, put put the brakes on, on the clan invasion for 15 years. I'm just pointing out the, some pretty... Uh, uh, straightforward facts that the houses were at the weakest at the periphery borders and especially in the area that the that the uh, the 
clans chose to attack. They didn't come through a periphery power of note. They didn't come through the Alberts Alliance or the Magistrate Canopus or the Turian Concordat. Had they hit them first and had to and burn and, and they would burn right through them. I'm not saying let's be. I'm not, I don't have any illusions here that clans would have run r roughshod right over any one of those three periphery powers. But there would have been just enough of a of a delay and an impact for the inner sphere leadership to wake up to the real threat that was coming that was bearing down on them and had an opportunity to begin to put things into motion to help deal with it because they all understood that the periphery powers were no match to their any one house but they also understood there's a reason why the Turing Concordat and the Magistrate Canopus and the Outwards Alliance still exist even into the modern uh, more or less into the modern times is because They've been around for 700 damn years, seven, six, six to eight centuries, and they've dealt with attack after attack, and they're not slouches in their own defense. So if an outside force is powerful enough to roll through them in uh, uh, multiple fronts and engage their forces and, and basically destroy them, the inner sphere is going to wake up to that much faster than a handful of bandits and pirates fleeing into the inner sphere, from the periphery into the inner sphere, screaming of boogeyman from the, from the depths of space coming after them. So the fact is, once again, the clans inadvertently or intentionally chose the had the least resistance to the through the periphery to the inner sphere. Just pointing out the obvious there. Okay. So second wave, Falcon Strikes, Apollo, fifth wave, Clan Snord. I did a video on on the clan uh, or on uh, Snord's irregulars, uh, and there's there's two. Uh, Rhonda's, Rhonda's Irregulars and, and Cranston Snords Irregulars. So there's two source books, game books for the Snords. And in it, uh, Rhonda's, uh, Rhonda uh, Snord and her uh, Irregulars managed to capture Camelot Command, which is this this former Star League repair ba naval repair base in a ne in the Dark Nebula, I believe. It's here somewhere. Yeah, uh, Camelot Clan uh, Command in the Dark Nebula, and I'd always believed that the that it had been it said specifically somewhere in the lore that that facility has the manu had the ability to manufacture warships, not just repair and maintain them, but actually had it was a manufacturing facility, a Star League era, which implies a lot of automation, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, technology, and and that and of course then it was implied it was going to take a gener fifteen or twenty years to get it up and running and so on and so forth. But somehow in uh, Rhonda's, uh, Rhonda uh, Snord's Irregulars source book, they modified that so it wasn't it wasn't an actual manufacturing uh, shipyard but a repair facility that had been grossly stripped over time and so it was uh, not nearly as a big a catch as what it was suggested now I know that was part of a video game right I mean I never played it and I'm sure somebody more than one of you have probably had the opportunity to play that video game and know more about what the game said about it but in here in the Jade Falcon source book, it's pretty specific. So going about Clan Jade Falcon felt Rhonda snorted and sold to every clansman since Nicholas Kerensky himself. The regulars made a deep raid into Falcon occupation zone to the planet Apollo. The gold recovered Star League data that revealed the location of the legendary naval base located in the Dark Nebula. Blah blah blah. Star, uh, Star Colonel Damien's cluster boarded to drop ships, the Dark Wings attached to them, Hawkeye and a Jesus class uh, cruiser, and jumped into the Dark Nebula, arriving at base known as Camelot Command. The Dark Wings landed on the huge asteroid station, channels the Ghost to trial possession, which they promptly lost. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Clever use tactics, blah, blah, blah. Star Colonel Damien's defeat, blah, blah. blah. Uh, right here. So. The hands of Rhonda Snore, who piloted a Highlander, the captain of the Hawkeye, angered because the clan law forbid him to intervene and blast the bandits off the base, jumped back to Apollo and formed the cans of Clan Jade Falcon via HPG transmission. The bandit case now possessed a warship construction facility. That one line. That's where I always believed, and when I said, when I did the video on, on, uh, uh, Rhonda Snore's irregulars, that she had captured this facility that, 
manufactured warships and then had to put a redaction in there saying that, well, I guess the book it didn't say that. It's saying that it was a repair facility and that it was heavily gutted uh, when the Starlink left. That's not what this says. And as a player, as the gamer, you make the decision, which is it? I mean, I don't believe that they found a shipyard capable of producing a limited production of warships, but that's just my personal thing. Battle of Tukiad, Tukiad Aftermath. Said here, the defeat of Tukiad shocked and angered the clans and forced them to take time to put their own houses in order. Because the ill clan Yurik still holds the highest position of power in the clans, we assume any attempts to remove him have failed. Immediately after Tukia, uh, Can Cristo sent several advisors back to Clan Space, apparently at the request of Can Critchell, and as a result, the Falcons rebuilt their forces more quickly than the other clans. They were among the first to receive new troops and equipment from their homeworld, and, uh, and though it took several months for them to resupply and evaluate the post Tukiad situation, and the amount of time that the Nova Cats and Ghost Bears received only an absolute minimum of supplies of Clan Space. It took a year for all the clans to regain their full strength, but by that time the warriors were looking for new battles. Clan Critchell apparently used this time to further solidify his position as senior or acting senior Khan, and for Khan, Christu routinely carried messages marked the Khan's Critchell seal. Clan is, uh, Elias Critchell was obviously a dangerous political rival, as he has twice succeeded in placing the blame for the military failure on the soldiers of his junior clan, Khan, etc. So, we got here Jade Falcon deployment. So the bulk of this source book, just like the bulk of this source book, is more about where their battles, what their battles were, and the breakdown of their units, which is great because I really like that. Uh, this is one of those things in lamented in a lot of the early source books for unit unit source books where they highlighted a specific company out of a of, out of a larger regiment force and they didn't do it in my mind any justice to the to the parent company that the that the the highlighted company represented and I think that they should have and this you know I've right I've said that before so we've got you know first wave all the various plans they hit second wave third wave I'm not gonna go through all these fourth wave fifth wave Worlds conquered by Jade Falcon, Prowl's possession. Then we get into the Jade Falcon military. We give us a little bit of bigger view, a deeper view of, of how the clans function as a whole. So you can use the blueprints from this book and this book and later the, the, the Warden and Crusader clan source books to give you a, a deeper idea of how all the clans would function in, uh, as a whole. You just need to tweak the clans that are not represented in source books at, at, at some point. It's standard warrior uniforms, dress uniforms, unit designation, communications, table organization, and equipment, or the tow. So, unit summaries, all the various units based on Falcons and reserves. And as you can see, Jay Falcons is pretty respectable. It's, I mean, this is a potent force. I mean, straight up. There's a reason for it being a potent force. You know, I mean, it just... Go on and go on. Then we got some highlights in interspaced in here. Uh, McQuarrie Horse, Star Colonel Adian Pride, Star Commander Joanna, <clears throat> various you know, uh, various ones they want to highlight and give you a flavor and a little bit deeper bio that gives once again gives you an example. Now what I like about this particular source book is, is this takes place after, just after the Battle of Tukiad. And so they can go through here and say, okay, well, here's here's Trinary Delta of, of what, what is that? Uh, the 7th Falcon Regulars Cluster. Trinary Delta, uh, unit nickname Hazen's Destroyers, unit identification J, uh, letter D on the left side of the cluster insignia. We got Delta Nova, Delta Strider 1, Delta Strider 2. So we look at... Delta, the Delta Nova, Star Captain Jewel Fang, Elite Uther, wounded in action. Right? Mechware Cast and Elite, Loki A. Mechware Huber, uh, Veteran Thor, wounded in action. Wounded in action. KIA. Four elementals, wounded in action. KIA. You see, they show you just how decimated the, the, the clans were when they came out of uh, the, the clans that participated in uh, Tukiat and their forces were pretty well beat up. And we got uh, some color uniforms, insignia, camouflage, 
a nice round out to give you some flavor and some color codes for painting your minis and things like this. Falcon camo, forest camo, desert camo, winter camo. And then we got, we're back into you know, 12 Falcon regulars, Jade Falcon Erie Cluster. I mean, just page after page, it shows you how big the Clan, uh, Clan J Falcon was at Battle of Tukiad. And if you're following what's going on with J Falcon in the current era of uh, the uh, uh, post Ill Clan area and, and uh, pending uh, Dominion Divided. You know, the Jade Falcons have pretty much been under, uh, uh, Mal Malvina Hazen have pretty much been decimated and destroyed. Part of them have been reconstituted as a guard unit for uh, the Ill Clan while there were surviving members of Jade Falcon back in their occupation zone is uh, str uh, str struggling to try to, to re reestablish themselves or to build up the the J Falcons to a point where they can withstand what's coming and have a chance to survive or they're in survival mode and the fact that they're capable of doing that and how they go about doing it you really need to read uh, uh, I don't have the name I just finished the novel what was it uh, survival something jeez I just finished the damn thing. I can't remember the title of it already. So many books to read. So many books to read. So many books I've read. So many to keep trying to keep up on. It's uh, pretty potent. Uh, the, the surviving blood name individual becomes can of, by default of Jay Falcon in the occupation zone. And he immediately sets, sets about trying to rebuild his Toman. And he needs bodies. He needs mech warriors. So what's he do? He travels to the... Uh, Razzlehag Dominion and issues a botchel to uh, the some colonel there, what's his face, and wants to um, trade. If he loses, he's going to trade his vault ship Gamma. Uh, if he wins, he gets several, uh, several sub sub about to graduate Sib Coves full of uh, would be uh, warriors. And, you know, you couldn't pull that stunt off in the inner sphere. For an inner sphere house would not be able to do that. Uh, it's only the clans that can see can really find a way to turn that stuff to their advantage. I'm still trying to digest all that in my head and how that played out and how that works and how it's going to play out. So we have a couple new mech designs: the Baboon, 20 ton, 20 ton LRM carrier for the for the most part. Because that's all it's armed with is three uh, three LRM fives. I've never operated that one. Hell the Hellhound, a 50 ton uh, standard, pretty good, pretty good loadout. Armor's respectable. Speed's not too bad. The Vixen, I got one in here that really turns my eye because of because it's loaded with eight <laughs> AC2s. Everybody hates, everybody loves to hate on the AC2s, but uh, this there's one in here that's just packing a wallop and of AC2. There we go, the Kraken, the Kraken. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to field one of these things or put them put them through their paces. I never did, but it's packing ten LC2 Ultras. So there's there's five in the left arm and five in the right arm, and then. Uh, Four machine guns, four machine guns, and the right torso. So this thing is a—it's just a ranged beast. If you got, some, I'm just—I'm just saying. You got 19 tons of armor, so it's armored up the yang. Of course, it's a 100-ton machine, so you expect that. But I looked at the, the weapon loadout. So you got one, two, three, four, five. So five ultra AC2 ultras at five tons apiece. There's 25 tons, and then another 25 tons of ultras. So we got. 50 tons of this 100 ton mech in weapon systems. So what kind of weapon loadout could this thing have carried if it had had a, bear, a wider diversity of weapon systems? And and I know the AC2s, everybody really hates on them. Uh, there's, there's some fans, and they do serve a, a very limited role in specifics, but as an overall weapon, weight versus, uh, you know, its damage impact, it's, it's a not a good exchange unless you're capable of packing them together in a bra. So basically, you got this modified Gatler that's going to fire ten rounds, you know, potentially twenty rounds of uh, uh, down down range at extreme range, and uh, with a what twenty to fifty percent chance or twenty to fifty percent ratio of hit hit percentages. 
I'm just, you know, you have to wonder. Right? You have to wonder. I mean, I have not, there are guys, you know, there are plenty of you who have been gaming for 40 years. You've been war top, uh, running the war top game and the video games since the beginning of Battletech. Uh, I haven't played an actual Battletech war top, tabletop, or video game of any sort since uh, 19, uh, or since 2002. So I'm just pointing out that uh, you guys have got more, more experience than that than I do. So I, I tend to uh, bow to other providers who have much more information, much more personal knowledge of various mech units and how they function and, and their beliefs and their opinions. Although I still have my opinions on machinery that I played in back in the day. And it comes down to, you can have mediocre machines, but if you got really good pilots and you got really good tactics and some luck, you can pull off some pretty fantastic stuff. It's just a matter of, at the end of the day, having fun. You know, I mean, that's the truth as far as I'm concerned. So anyway, you know, get into this, get into that. Here we go. Jade Falcon Sourcebook provides a complete overview of the deadly Jade Falcons, one of the premier clans, fan. Falcon history, culture, and military capabilities are explored. Right, and I paid $15, $15 for this in 1992. And this... I, this first issue, I don't know if they ever reprinted it or not, but I guarantee you this was, I bought this immediately as soon as it showed up on the bookshelf. And this was before you, you could go online and just order stuff from the manufacturer. You could get off stuff online, but generally you didn't even know it was coming down the pike until it hit the shelves. I mean, we're talking the early 90s. I had a American Online. And in 90, I'll tell you right, the, in, in the 90s, it, you were paying by the hour for internet service. You did not spend a whole lot of time just cruising around for, for nothing or just for stuff. You really needed to have an idea. Unless you had extremely deep pockets, you really had to have an idea of what it was you were looking for when you got online because it was expensive. It was really expensive. Most people today have no concept. If you didn't grow up in the generation where we paid by the hour, I remember one month I had an $800 phone bill. $800. The phone bill was usually like $30, $40 back then. So $800 was insane. And it was just because I knew I, uh, we had a tax refund show up. That, that's what saved my back, uh, my backside. And then uh, in 95, I broke my knee. I broke my main ligament in my uh, right knee and had to have surgery. So I was off work for six months. And about three days after I, I broke my knee and was off work, suddenly American Online went flat rate. It was all I could choke on. I didn't get out of my, I almost didn't get out of my chair for three days. My wife had to scream at me to go get a shower because I hadn't moved from the bed or from the, from the table. And uh, this was before the surgery took place. And it was a glorious thing. And now we take it for granted. I, I can't tell you how many hours I spend online either playing uh, this video game or that video game or just cruising through all the various video uh, video information and, and, and websites and Battletech stuff. Right now I'm absorbing as much material as I can from as many sources as I can because I'm kind of right now in that kind of a kick on it. So anyway, this is Rick. And tell you, and until next time, you guys have a great weekend.